So hello. Welcome to the storytelling for Wilder World webinar. We're waiting for a few minutes for more people to join. It would be great um, if you can write a message in the discussion area, maybe your name, where you're coming from, or anything specific you are expecting from this um, webinar today. So I think we'll give it another one to two minutes and then we will start. So you see um, when you've entered this webinar, there's a place where you can chat. So basically put in some message um, for us or other participants. And then you also have an area um, with, um, for questions where you can post your questions. We will review them during the webinar and um, maybe we'll answer some right away. Others maybe in the panel discussion um, at the end, so like this Q and A at the end, or if we don't manage to answer all these questions, um, we are um, yeah writing them back via email. So we have people, of course, joining from Africa, the presenters from the UK. Cornwall, France, again, UK, ex South Africa. It's great to see such a big audience joining. So I think we already 46, 47 people who joined. So let's give it half a minute and then we will start another one from UK, Finland, Zambia, South India, Ghana. So I think we can almost say people joining from the entire from the entire globe, and even Netherlands. <laughs> so close by Germany, Slovakia, Portugal. Well, yeah, so we have 51 at the moment. And I think we're going to start the session right now. Yeah, to everyone, a warm welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm Alexander from Open Forest. Um, we are the organization and creator of Explored Land, which is a platform for map-based and transparent storytelling. And today we are co-hosting this webinar together with our partner from Rewild Africa, a storytelling agency for transformative story crafting. I hope you are as excited as I am to learn more about storytelling for a wilder world. We are here together because we believe that there is a better story than the one we are experiencing in recent times. So basically, we are fed up with the past stories of environmental destruction, climate change, injustice, and mass extinction. So we believe that there is a better world possible and that there is a way towards it. But the big question is, how do we get there? Hampus Jacobson, um, a climate tech investor, answered these questions I found um, very nicely in a recent podcast. Um, and he answered it the following way. So we, we have on one hand, we have policies that can intensive, uh, incentivize, for example, via taxes and laws. We have technologies 
which can enable, so it delivers a solution, for example, regenerative energy. And the third component he mentioned is behavior selects. So basically we decide what kind of technology we want to use. We select if we want organic farming over conventional farming and sustainable forest management over monoculture plantations. So we select what kind of future we want. And I would like to add a fourth point to it. Stories form behavior. So stories have shaped and developed our cultures and behavior for thousands of years. While different stories create new behavior, new behavioral patterns let us select and decide for a healthier, more flourishing and more diverse future. And we need all of that. So better policies, new technology, different behavior to select a better future. And I can clearly see the prominent role of stories. In this webinar, we're going to explore the transformative power of stories and discover how your project story can unleash its power for you. So now sharing again my screen with you. Um, the agenda for today. So the major input session will start um, with Rewild Africa with Samuel Chevalier and a special guest. Um, it's about storytelling for a wider world. It's about the origins and science of transformative storytelling and how this, to discover your project story. And of course, the special guest. Um, next presentation will be by Bernard from African Origin Oils. He will present, present a very personal story of how, um, how the Kalahari melon oil um, is building a new climate resilient economy in South Africa. And the final presentation is by Misha from Green Pop Foundation. He will present an example of how active planting itself has become the powerful story. After the input session, we're going to have a Q&A, 15, maybe 20 minutes, depending on how many questions you have. And I hope we can answer your burning questions. And now we will have a very quick um, brief introduction um, of the presenters themselves before we are entering um, into the presentation. So stop presenting now. So maybe Misha, you can start. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs> My name is Misha Teasdale. Um, I'm one of the founders, co-founders and directors of Green Pop. We're based in Cape Town, South Africa. And we're on a mission to get people active and not anxious about the state of the planet. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Bernard. Uh, Bernard is fine. <laughs> Thanks, Misha. Uh, I'm really uh, honored actually to be here. Uh, Green Pop and uh, Open Forest and Rewild are doing some really incredible work and we're just happy to share the stage. Um, so I'm Bernard. I'm one of the founders of African Origin Oils. I'm from South Africa originally, but I moved to the UK as a child, which is where I'm based now. I hold a PhD in immunochemistry. And before I got into the world of cosmetic ingredients and beauty products, I had a short career in finance. That's me. So then Sam and special guest. <laughs> uh... Hello everyone, I'm calling in from a very chilly cold Cape Town, um, although the sun has just popped out, which is great. Um, I'm a founder and director of Rewild Africa, uh, a storytelling company based out of um, South Africa. Uh, we call ourselves a storytelling company more than a film company. I'll go a little bit into that as we get into the webinar, but the special guest is uh, Alessandra. I'll let Alessandra uh, tell you a little bit about herself, but she's been she's one of the creative directors in our projects and just has one of the most incredible eyes for storytelling and uh, connecting with people. Ale. Thank you, Sam. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm apparently the special guest. Uh, <laughs> I'm joining this exciting workshop last minute, um, but with the intention of bringing a few examples of the people that Rewild has met along the way 
and the stories that we think could serve as an example of how we are working towards changing a narrative for humans on this earth and, and how exciting that is and how, you know, we transitioning from an industrial era to an ecological era. So the story, education, experiences and relationship and approach to business must change. So I'm excited to go in there a little bit later. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Alex. I think it's chill, or is it? Or do I pass it back to you there, Alex? Um, well, basically, you can start right away with your presentation, Sam. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, well, firstly, let me just share my screen then. Uh, share screen. Right. Can can you guys see my screen? I think you can. Yeah. Perfect. Alrighty. Well, firstly, um, thank you so much for for listening. And um, I forgot to introduce uh, a very important character, which is I'm not sure if you can still see my screen, but here's a little elephant over here. This is Albi. Albi is the character of Rewild Africa, um, and uh, one of our directors in the business helps us to make decisions. Uh, we always ask uh, what Aldi would say uh, from the perspective of the wilder world. So always important to introduce Aldi. Um, but yeah, really excited to, to go through this presentation with you all. I thought it would be appropriate to actually start this story um, from a story itself. Uh, so I'm just going to read a story to you. Um, it should take around three or so minutes. Uh, but this is a, a story called Thinking Like a Mountain by Aldo, Leop Aldo Leopold, uh, who uh, had a really significant influence on me when I was uh, studying my, my master's in ecological design thinking at Schumacher College. It had a very profound impact on me, specifically my lecturer, Stephen Harding. Um, uh, we would walk around the, around the property at uh, Schumacher College and talk about the, our relationship with nature, Gaia theory, deep ecology, um, and all the rest. And I, before I tell you the story, Leopold was involved in the science of wiping out the entire wolf population from the USA. Um, and the story takes place in the Gila, the Gila wilderness in New Mexico. Um, him and his mates were walking with rifles uh, in case they got the chance to kill some wolves. So visualize for a moment, um, you know, you, you sitting on top of a mountain, um, specifically uh, at the rim rock. So I'll tell you exactly at what point to visualize that. But I'll start with off by saying, only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of the wolf. Those unable to decipher the hidden meaning know nevertheless that it is there, for it is felt in all wolf country and distinguishes that country from all other land. It tingles in the spine of all who hear wolves by night or who scan their tracks by day. Even without sound or sight of wolf, it is implicit in a hundred small events, the midnight whining of a pack horse, the rattle of rolling rocks, the bound of a fleeing deer, the way shadows lie under the spruces, only the in inducible tyro can fail to sense the presence or absence of wolves, or the fact that mountains have a secret opinion about them. My only conviction on the score dates from the day I saw a wolf die. So just, just to, before I go into the story again, just imagine now that you are, you are on this rock uh, looking over the wilderness. We were eating lunch on a high rock, rim rock at the foot of which a turbulent river elbowed its way. We, we saw that we thought was a doe fording the torrent. Her breast awash in the white water. When she climbed the bank towards us and shook out her tail, we realized our error. It was a wolf. A half dozen others, evidently grown pups, 
sprang from the willows and all joined in a welcoming, welcoming melee of wagging tails and playful mealings, mawlings. What was literally a pile of wools writhed and tumbled in the center of an open flat at the foot of our rim rock. In those days, we never ever heard of passing up a chance to kill a wolf. In a second, we were pumping lead into the pack, but with more excitement than accuracy. How to aim down a steep hill and uh, how to point downhill and shoot is always confusing. When our rifles were empty, the old wolf was down and a pup was dragging a leg into an impossible slide of rocks. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire die in her eyes. I realized then and have known ever since that there was something new to me in those eyes, something known only to her and to the mountain. I was young then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. But after seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed upon such a view. So the reason why I really like this, this, this story um, is that it, it really brings uh, about an idea that the, that the, the character is realizing that wolves play an integral role in the mountain. Um, and the story helped me realize that in, in seeing predators in landscapes, that they are just as important to, to the growing populations of deer in those mountains. And so just to bring you into this concept, storytelling, as, 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 we, as Alex mentioned earlier, has been something that we've seen throughout our past, throughout our history. You know, and it is a responsibility that a storyteller has. Like I, I had this incredible um, workshop um, a couple of years ago, um, a couple of years ago, uh, where I was out in, um, apologies, uh, with Martin Shaw in England, in Devon. Um, and he was teaching us about storytelling. And I'll never forget sitting next to the fire and listening to him around the fire. He would really speak with his voice and, and he would go into character and he would really tell the story in a way that was so engaging. And this is just something I wanted to bring up because we have a responsibility to those that are listening to engage them in our story. So as we talk about our stories, how are we thinking about our audience? How are we really engaging them into our story uh, in a way that is meaningful? You know, stories have also taught us many things uh, over the years. You know, there's this beautiful story about the relationship of hippos in the landscape. And, and there's a story about how hippos would move towards the rivers. So it was from a, a, a writer um, who, who's called Lawrence van der Post. And it's this beautiful story told about how a hippo moves from the hot areas into rivers to try and keep cold. And through the story, you are learning a number of different things about, about the hippo. It's a very playful story, but it brings in very, very key lessons um, to, to the viewer. So when a story enthralls us, we are inside of it, feeling what the protagonist feels, experience it as if it was indeed happening to us. Have you ever thought about a teacher at school where, you know, is this incredible teacher. Just think for a moment, the best teacher you've ever had. They really engage you into your, into your subject. They make it feel alive. Like this is key to storytelling. You're making something burn within them. Um, the learning becomes engaging and alive. And this is a big element to storytelling. So just talking a little bit about the hero's journey. Um, uh, Joseph Campbell, an incredible writer, I think. If, if you're listening to this and you have some time to, to read a couple of his books, Jan Joseph Campbell really talks uh, uh, about the power of storytelling. And this is this hero's journey that he, he speaks about where uh, uh, you know, a character goes through an adventure um, and this call to adventure really 
forces them to move towards something that's fearful, you know, or uh, something they don't understand, or there's like a call to adventure um, that tests them significantly. And you'll see that in all the great works and all the stories uh, that we see today, there's all this, all this big, um, you know, maybe it's an enemy or a big adventure that they have to do. It's, it's, it's we as the audience can feel into the character as it goes into the cave. So, you know, one of the things that Joseph Campbell speaks about is, you know, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Um, and that's, you know, within your storytelling, like try and bring that into, into how you talk about your story. Like for, for Rewild Africa, um, you know, I, I went through, through quite a, a significant um, change in, in thought. A story really uh, changed the way that I saw the world. And when I was at Schumacher College in England, um, we, we learned about René Descartes and, and how he sp spoke about, uh, I think, therefore I am, which, which was one of the first ways in which we kind of disconnected our worldview from nature. Um, and this mechanical worldview, uh, you know, really reduced nature. So, you know, we would look at like a frog and, and, and open up a frog to see the clockwork of a frog, not so much anything else. You know, that's how we began to see nature. This is a narrative in and itself and something that we've had to work with and, and work against in a way to try and reconnect with nature in a way that isn't so mechanical. So how do we actually begin to see that, like that influence that story has had with us in the, in the natural world and the wilder world? How do, how do we actually see ourselves as embedded ecological systems? Um, and this is something at Rewild Africa that we are trying to, to engage with and we're trying to build into our story. You know, our mission is to shed lights on solutions to ecological restoration. So the cave that, you know, that we need to walk into is, is you know, how do we, understand this disconnect of nature. Uh, what are the narratives that, that, that have engaged us and that have stopped us on our journey? And how do we explore science and emotional storytelling to engage audiences to either reconnect with nature or connect deep with deeper projects um, with some of, the, some of the clients that we've worked with? And, you know, this is an image that's very pixelated, but uh, it's, it's one of my favorite images. Um, well, it's my image um, that I took um, when I was 25 years old, and I had the unique experience of being able to to travel the Amazon Amazon River. And you know, I, I wrote my thesis on on ecological learning through direct experience, and, and how like we can really connect with nature through really just experiencing it. You know, like someone who talks about a forest all the time will never know until we really walk into the forest. Um, and this is when I started to like look at my own, my own story. You know, this is what is our own story, um, and how do we look to reconcile with nature through through our own story? Um, and I had the privilege of of going to to uh, work at the Cape Leopard Trust um, and train as a game ranger at Londolosi Game Reserve, and I just being able to 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 meet indigenous wisdom was one of the most incredible ways in which I could connect with the wild world. Um, and, and one of the strongest elements to, to, to our story is really engaging with that wisdom. You know, to be able to, to come back to this wilder world uh, and, and, and connect with the stories, it's, it's really engaging with this wisdom that has been isolated and, and disconnected from, from society for quite some time. And as we emerge back into this level of connection with the indigenous wisdom, um, it, it, it's really starting to help our storytelling uh, in a way that is, is very, very connected with the natural world. And so, and, and this is also another uh, story that we're looking at here. This is a, 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 just a picture of, of a rhino on foot. And, um, you know, you know, a lot of people fear nature, they, they, they are disconnected from nature. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest, you know, in storytelling, we have characters, and the, the wilderness is full of characters. You know, this rhino ahead of us here is a character. And, you know, people explain that 
you know, communication is a very reduced word of understanding how we can connect with nature. People often say, if I had a superpower, I would um, try and talk with animals. You know, every single moment that we have with the natural world, we are communicating with it. Every, every interaction that we have with it, we are communicating with it. This rhino was telling us something in this moment, just because it wasn't using English to engage with us, doesn't mean it wasn't there. So often, you know, you know, this was the big call to adventure for me and, and things that I learned through my own story uh, is actually getting up and going out into nature and realizing that we are connected to nature and understanding what my fears were. Um, and through that, through that connection, you know, really learned a lot about a while the world. And this is also just something that was was incredible you know with within your within storytelling it's really important to engage with the ecological and the social aspects um of of your of your your business or whatever you're doing um but i think specifically you know with, within rewild we, we do design thinking which means that we try and really ask uh, who your users are and empathize with the, you know the story itself um, and i just wanted to bring up this uh, picture because it's a it's a picture of these young these young people that I got to spend time with in the Amazon who grew up on the Amazon and their playground was the Amazon and the stories that they created around them the mythological stories connected them to a sense of place um, and it was just one of the most remarkable uh, experiences that I had uh, when I was walking my call to adventure so just to you know conclude on that is a deep experience helps us to deeply question. Uh, which gives us deep commitment and 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 i think like you know when anyone is looking to tell their story you know how do we how do we like understand uh that call to adventure that forces us to have a deep experience to deeply question um and and brings us towards your mission uh as we are with rewild africa and we got to see this on this project here uh, uh google trekker where we hiked around south africa for, for a year and um, co-founder Alistair and I, uh, Alistair Danz and I, we, we conceptualized Real World Africa and, and we understood its mission. So, and, and that's a huge part of your story because understanding your mission is actually understanding the cave that you're walking into over the next couple of years. And I hope that's really tying in here, you know, like where, where you are looking to build your story, understand what that sort of mission is that you're looking to achieve. And, you know, for us, it's, it's solutions to a wilder world um, uh, and, and, and shining light on that. And, and we take science and emotive storytelling. So information is not well retained um, if it's not uh, mixed with emotion. Um, and so this is the information that we, are, that we have currently on the planet that, you know, that there's significant impacts with the planetary boundaries for biodiversity loss and the loss of the bio biosphere. And that this conversation that we used to have whilst hiking around South Africa, like not understanding how we can solve this problem was something that we spoke about for a long, long time. Um, and realizing that storytelling could engage, could be one way in which we can solve for this problem. Um, and, and therefore, you know, going back to the point that if information is that climate change is happening um, and you know, we're losing biodiversity, how do we engage our users? Going back to the beginning of this webinar, how do you realize the audience that you're talking to to build empathy for, for what you are, are trying to get across? And in doing that, you know, you're trying to, to, to bring about the underlying universal truths and, and creating empathy through authenticity, um, which is really important. How do you tell your story in the most authentic way? And I think that's what's so beautiful about collaboration with Open Forest is that Rewild Africa seeks to, to build that level of authenticity. And storytelling is, 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 asking, uh, is asking us to, to be more transparent. And that's why I'm so excited about this collaboration with Open Forest. So moving towards that idea of transparency, transformational media, you know, Rewild doesn't really want to make beautiful content. You know, we're in the business of stories where we are actually having an um, impact and helping people wake up. Um, and that's what we really believe in. So it's essentially moving towards behavior change. Um, and how do we realize these problems of biodiversity loss and climate change and make it more real for them? Climate change is not a line running at you. 
So it's hard to make behavior change. It's, it's just happening. So how do you make it more relatable? And through character, through a character, you can help them be more relatable. You know, realizing, uh, telling a story of, of a negative thing. For example, a farmer um, that is using a lot of pesticides or something negative on the land. Don't tell, you can't tell the story that we need to stop that. We need to tell the story of how that farm owner is changing. Um, and how that and seeing the transformation in that farmer, um, and that's really important uh, in in transformational media. Um, and this is the image of uh, of uh, my dad's documentary in Bloodlines, and how a visual image can have such an impact. This is the story of bloodlines and how lines are being bred for the bullet um, in, in in very unethical ways. And this image is just such a powerful image to show how. These lines are being um, bred in captivity. So visual storytelling has such a powerful way that like affects our brains and connects us with the story. So I got really into all of that and it was really beautiful to just kind of dig into some of the elements of storytelling that engage us. Um, and I just want to pass it on to Ale uh, just to quickly speak, well, as, as briefly as, as you like um, on gender-based violence and the kind of uh, what, what's been happening in New World Africa for you and some of your stories. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. So we very recently worked on a project for Action 24, which is a project developed by the African Climate Reality um, Project, which is the African section of a worldwide movement that spread from the Al Gore documentary on climate change. And we were asked to document across South Africa um, stories of people on the ground that are uh, change makers and that are inspiration for a broader society. So the doku series that we've developed, uh, it was divided it was a thematic uh, series. So there were five episodes on community, gender, um, journalism, youth, and journalism. And in particular, I want to take the time to just um, look a little bit closer to the gender story. So the person that you are seeing here on the screen is Sibongile Tungwa and she is the founder and director of the Women Leadership and Training Program in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And so she is from the village and she, she was a different little girl and she went the opposite direction of what um, women are meant to go in a village type of society. And she decided to um, re-engage in education. And, and she's now really fostering women leaders in a context where tradition, the Zulu tradition, actually doesn't accept um, women to be more educated than men. So we went there to document the agroecology gardens that these women were um, developing. Um, but then we came across uh, so much more than that. This woman uh, is a powerhouse and she really, she was really able to tie together cause and issues to solutions. Um, you know, um, in the South African context and in villages, often still happens that when women, which are the ones expected to go and fetch water and fetch wood, when they walk towards the water, um, there's a lot of harassment and rape and the traditional um, society still accept this as 
something part of their culture. But slowly, this woman and other young women, they are changing the narrative. And what I would like to highlight in, in particular, based on this story, is the fact that this woman wasn't just talking about gender-based violence. This woman um, expressed um, in the interview that we conducted with her, the fact that if we have alcoholism, if we have gender bias, and if we have all other um, pro problems is because we are disconnected from who we are and we are part of nature and we are intelligent beings and we are here on this planet to collaborate, to do something good for the collective good. So I was personally very strongly inspired by the way she was able to elegantly tie together the issue to a new vision for the future and how all of us can contribute because very often we feel powerless. We see issues and we see that they are so big that there's nothing that we can do, but we can just by sharing the story with someone else or just by, um, you know, engaging a little bit um, in movements that already is, exist, we can all take part in this change. So, yeah, as an approach to storytelling, Rewild uh, takes very complex issues and tries to simplify them through character-driven stories in order for the audience to really identify and relate to someone that is living in a village in South Africa and experience with them what they experience. When you're able to feel that, then you can start changing the mindset. So emotion in storytelling really foster behavioral change and that's what we focus on at Rewild. We really are proud to say that Rewild is a film company that strives not to be a film company because film and photography is a tool. And there's so much more that we have to do out there on this planet. So we, yeah, we hope through film, education and experiences to really be able to reach as many people as possible for the good cause. And um, we're only, uh, we're 25 minutes in. Okay. So we're gonna have we're gonna have to pass on. I'm gonna uh, just share in the chat a link to this film if you want to go deeper and see I think what Alex shared it already. Oh fantastic. Sorry. But yeah, Anna, thank you so much. As I said, creative director. An unbelievable storytelling, you know. Um, I don't know what real Africa would be without Alessandra. <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much, yeah, for this great presentation. Thank you very much. So we will hand over to Bernard. Firstly, I'll unmute and then I'll just quickly get my screen arranged. Can everybody see that? Yes, it that has built up. Perfect. The floor is yours. You can also see, sorry. Go ahead, it's, it's yes. your time. <laughs> you can see, uh, it's, it's all set. Okay, uh, thanks Ale, thanks uh, Sam for that. Um, so before I start talking about our actual storytelling, I will first tell you just a brief version of our actual story, just so that you know what we're working with. Our story starts over 10 years ago close to where I grew up in South Africa, when the region where my grandfather and my uncle were farming was hit by a drought. Three long years later, it was declared the worst drought for 80 years. Following successive failed harvests, my grandfather and uncle were desolate. Their maize and sunflower crops never made it out of the ground. 
but in their place, they grew thousands of Kalahari melons. These extremely bitter melons had evolved in the Kalahari desert so they could withstand and thrive in this extreme ecosystem. In fact, the less competition from the maize and the sunflowers, the better they seemed to fare. Most farmers think of the Kalahari melon as a nuisance, a worthless weed, something they wouldn't like to have on their land and would actively work to eradicate. To his great credit, my uncle took a different view and he wondered if there might be something more to these bitter melons. He started asking around, seeking guidance and discussing ideas with other farmers, academics and business people. The argan oil boom was just taking off around that time. So a chance conversation at an agricultural fair led him to take a closer look at the seeds of the melons with a view to producing an oil for the cosmetics industry. I was coming to the end of my PhD at the time so my uncle reached out to better understand the scientific properties of the oil, but also for help with reaching the market in Europe where I was studying. Our interest peaked as we discovered that the oil contained twice as much essential fatty acids and five times more vitamin E than argan oil, which was the most popular cosmetic oil at the time. With this, we knew we had a premium product for an enormous market, but to actually sell any of it was a different story. So when starting a business, people normally say, and they did say, pick your market first and then cater to their needs. For us, it was the other way around. We knew we had a really good product and that someone somewhere would probably buy it. But our challenge was to find them and convince them. To better understand our product, we reached out to local experts in South Africa, universities, engineers, and manufacturers of other oils. We also approached the market absolutely everywhere. We spoke to anyone who would listen at trade fairs and conferences, through Facebook groups and LinkedIn searches, by cold calling and out of the blue emailing, really to anyone, even if it looked like, they're only, like they might only be remotely interested at best. Of all the places, our first order, one of our first orders came from Japan. We also worked a bit on our storytelling methods, but I'll get to that a bit later. Today, about 10 years since my uncle and I first discussed Kalahari melon oil, we have now sold our oil to cosmetics formulators, brands, and distributors across the world on every continent except Antarctica. The, the drought, which was the original catalyst for this project, has unfortunately become the new norm and the challenges it brought still remain. In 2018 alone, for example, 30,000 people in South Africa lost their jobs as a direct result of drought. But we now have a new wild crop, a new weapon against these effects of climate change, a new tool with which to bring real social impact. And that's just the Kalahari melon. If we can get it right, we also have the power of storytelling. So now that I've told you our story, I'll quickly explain why storytelling is so important in our industry. Storytelling to the beauty industry is a bit like convenience to McDonald's. It's not the actual hamburger, but it's the method with which they sell it. The most successful companies sell billions of dollars of products in very large part due to good storytelling. Often, the more expensive the product, the better the storytelling. Not necessarily the story itself, but the storytelling. I'll give you a quick example. This is Tiffany Masterson. She used to be an editor at a beauty magazine, and she's also one of the best storytellers in the business. She is the founder and chief creative officer of Drunk Elephant, a beauty brand. A common safari legend tells how elephants love eating fermented marulas, a wild fruit, and then stumble around the forest tipsy. The story caught Tiffany's imagination and served as her inspiration for her new brand's identity. Marula oil and the enchanting story that went with it became her hero ingredient. 
She used bright colors and tapped into social movements by using of the moment language. She understood consumer psychology and knew how to generate hype. She didn't own her story. She wasn't a farmer or a gamekeeper or an elephant conservationist or even a dermatologist or a scientist, but she avidly told her story. People really brought, bought into the brand's persona, its story, if you will. And as a result, they loved the products. So much so, in fact, 10 years after she launched the brand, she sold her company for $845 million. Here is the deal reported by the magazine where Tiffany used to be a senior editor. So, okay, for us in this audience, storytelling is really important. Yes, for the sake of the climate, our environment, and for the well-being of our society. But it can pay pretty well too. My challenge to this particular audience is this. If Tiffany Masterson can create all of that after hearing a safari fable, just imagine what we can do. We being the actual farmers, the conservationists, the scientists and the technicians in the field. Real stories from the people who are on the ground. Okay, so now that I've talked about our story and told you why storytelling is so important, I'll finish by talking about how we've approached it. I'll share a few key takeaways from our experience. It's by no means some kind of gold standard. I've already told you who to look to for that. Ever since we first started trying to get a foothold in the market, no matter how much data or logic or rationale we threw at the buyers, all they wanted was a story they could sell. It was incredibly frustrating. Back then when we first started, we didn't even know we had a story. We just knew we had a good product that was better and the same price or even cheaper than the other oils they were buying. But as we started learning more about the broader context in which we were operating, the ongoing drought in South Africa, about the people we were working with, about other challenges and initiatives in the sustainability and social impact space, we began to really understand our own position and what our role was. Our mission became clearer because we understood more about the potential of the Kalahari melon and the work we were doing. And we were also learning more about what the world needed. So in some ways, for us, it was simply about the passing of time. So don't be frustrated or anxious if you feel like you don't have much of a story yet. Not everyone is a journalist or an editor who can fashion a piece of fiction out of thin air and run with it. So the first takeaway from our experience is simply that, as long as the passing of time is accompanied by learning and action, your story will begin to write itself. And crucially, it will be authentic. Once enough time had passed and we had a genuine story, I knew we had, had to find a better way to tell it. We were almost entirely reliant on a PowerPoint pitch deck filled with data. We had tables, bar charts, and scatter plots. It did have some pictures, but they were usually from an old smartphone with a dusty lens. Even so, it was always the pictures that sparked the most interest in our project. We really needed something eye-catching and engaging that could tell our story in a way that captured people's emotions and imaginations. And then one day through the power of the network, around mid 2018, I saw a short video made by Sam and the team at Rewild for an agave spirits brand based in South Africa. A couple of months later, after an intro and a few conversations, both Sam and his co-founder, Ali, were on our farm, shooting the footage for what would become our first piece of proper media. <clears throat> I hope you can see that. I hope so. A short four-minute uh, uh, four film that told the story of how we came to produce Kalahari melon oil, why its scientific properties are so unique, and how this special plant can bring genuine social impact to a remote part of the world where climate change is really being felt. Whereas the pictures in our presentation at least sparked some interest from the people we were talking to, the film actually generated valuable leads. 
which we've since been able to convert to paying customers for us. But I think more broadly, it was important that Ali and Sam were there on the farm, really actually physically there. The story was not created by the imagination of a journalist or a branding agency. Ali and Sam were actually experiencing our reality on the farm. Which brings me to my second point. I would urge you to craft your story on a foundation of facts. Don't just wrap it in a cloak of fiction. But even once you've done all that, buyers or investors or stakeholders might still be skeptical. They can see you've put some effort into media production, but is it really all that good? Is it really all you say it is? Just look at the recent examples of Theranos, the blood testing company whose founder is currently standing trial for fraud, or Fire Festival, the greatest party that never happened. People might wonder, does your story really stack up or is it just fluff? So show them, show them your project in whatever way that works for you to bring your audience closer to your work. This is how we're showing our work. With this tool called explorer.land created by our webinar hosts, Open Forests, I can bring our audience closer to the farm, exactly where Sam and Ali were three years, three years ago. I can use it for practical things like updating our customers and stakeholders for things like harvests, rainfall or bushfires. And all that just adds to our transparency, which in turn strengthens our story. For the members of this particular audience, please remember that transparency is our trump card. Us, the ecologists, the marine biologists, the gamekeepers and the trackers on the ground. Speculators and fictional storytellers who may enter your market and might even try to copy or adapt elements from your own story cannot offer transparency. So use it. It's the thing that makes your story authentic. And that's really, really important in 2021. The state of the, the, state of the world is too precarious to let just another good story get in the way of the facts. Thank you. Over to Misha, I think. Yes, please. Thank you very much, Bernard, for this great presentation. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's uh, yeah, it's been fantastic listening to these beautiful stories um, uh, from Sam and his team and Bernard. Really exciting. I'm just going to pop onto my share screen. Um, share screen. There we go. Great. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yeah. And are you looking at the presentation? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Cool. Um, so it's fairly challenging to squeeze this all into a, a 10 minute session. So I'm gonna do my best to, to give you some of the nuggets that for me have been the greatest learning in bringing together a journey of a story um, with the elements that for me inspire for action. Um, maybe just to start and, and where I am right now is normally when I start, I'm generally quite nervous. And those nerves I find are easily um, picked up by the audience. And so to allow for the, the storytelling to be as fluid as possible, I actually ask my audience to first stand up. So maybe you can come with me on this little uh, experiment and stand up and shake your hands out a little bit and then rise your hands into the air. And then I want you all to breathe out like lions and lionesses. <sighs> and what I find that does is just kind of eases us all into a little conversation, especially when you're the third or fourth uh, person on the lineup. Um, and yeah, I think people can get a little bit uh, soft in their seats and start slouching and it kind of resets everyone. So that's, 
a big powerful breath of oxygen thank you to the trees um, um yeah the my story follows a fairly simple narrative line uh, it's chronological um, and it captures my personal journey um, I generally start with looking at three key themes. Um, that is, where do I find my compassion? Um, trying to shift my perspective from going from a place of um, problems to a place of being uh, solution-based. And then the idea of being able to accomplish anything. Um, I've also got a hook that I've um, experienced and I use in my uh, in my talks, um, which is the journey of going from a place of success to a, a place of significance, um, and I try and bring that in as many times as possible. Um, and then, lastly, I try and end off with a way that gives the audience a bit of a wow factor, something that gives them something to think, "Wow, that's amazing." that you managed to achieve that, but then try and land it in something that's a little bit more humble. Um, so my journey began in 2008. I was fortunate enough to drive from Cape Town to London um, across 21 African countries. And um, I think much like any journey, journeys have the capacity to shape uh, one person. Um, and in that trip, I got to see incredible things. I got to go to amazing places. And I got three particular experiences out of it that really defined me as a character and set the, the foundation for, for me starting an environmental organization eventually. Um, the first thing was, I got to engage with a lot of people in a way that um, put me in very uncomfortable positions because I didn't understand the culture and I didn't understand the language. Um, one in particular, we broke down in a desert uh, mountain range um, in Northern Ethiopia and our lead vehicle had to drive back for a week and a half to Bahia to go and fetch a part that we needed. And I landed up befriending a, a priest who lived in a little cathedral on top of the hill. And in this cathedral, there was a window that cast just this little beam of light. There was no other windows at all. So it was very dark inside, but this one beam of light just shone. Um, and it was something magical about it. Um, and when we were in this room, we shared honey mead. And even though we weren't able to speak the same language, I recall this experience of every time we went there over that week's period, we would land up laughing and engaging in such a visceral way. The second thing was having been a big lover of nature and, and spending time on, on the continent of Africa, I got to see a huge amount of hardship and environmental ills. But as the journey progressed, I started to reshape my thinking. Now, there is this perspective that, a narrative that there is a lot of um, uh, environmental degradation in the world, and that can get you down. And what I found was that as I was going through this journey and shifting my perspective, I, I got to a place of kind of understanding my own entrepreneurial spirits of seeing problems and shifting those problems into opportunities. And then the last thing that came out of it was, we had to plan this trip across Africa for an entire year. And then the drive took us eight months in itself. L having left um, Rhodes Memorial in Cape Town and driving across an entire continent, continent and landing in Trafalgar Square eight months later, I got this experience of realizing that if I put my mind to it, if I applied myself, I could really um, accomplish anything. And that's kind of the basis of where my journey began. Um, so 
Off the back of that, we started an environmental organization called Green Pup. Um, it began as a campaign. Uh, we were just going to plant a thousand trees. Um, and we had never planted a tree before. Um, I didn't own a spade or a bucky. Um, I literally never put a tree in the ground. And over a month long period, um, we managed to plant a thousand trees and, and essentially start this campaign. And at the end of that month, I had this moment where uh, we had 250 staff come out from a company and uh, we planted 300 trees that day. And one of the managers from the company came to me and he, he shook my hand and he said, Misha, today I had one of my most significant South African moments. Um, I most of the time spend um, signing checks in an air conditioned office. And that got me thinking about what is my significance? How do I engage in the world? And so I started using that as part of my narrative is this shift from success to significance. One day we're all going to die. And when we do, what do we want to be thinking about? What do we want to have felt like we've achieved? And so that journey for me was a, was a really meaningful part of bringing it into my story um, time and time again. What do we do now? Well, we've got various restoration projects around Sub-Saharan Africa. And one of them for me that is uh, of most significance is in the Overberg region. Um, there we've planted 80,000 trees and 80,000 trees it doesn't really mean that much, but what does mean something to a lot of people is when you landed on a specific animal or something that's really meaningful about that space. So when I'm telling the story about this particular forest um, where you can see this leopard, um, there are these keystone or um, um, celebrity species that capture the imagination. As far as I know, it's the only big predator that's on this landscape. Um, outside of that, there are trees there that are over a thousand years old. So they're just absolutely incredible archetypal trees that have an ancestral roots in this landscape. And then it's the southernmost forest in the entire continent. So through that, you're able to start shaping this kind of visual landscape of why it's important to me and why it might be important to an audience that might want to come and help us plant trees or to funders. So that they feel like there's more happening on the ground than just putting trees um, into the earth. Um, and this in, um, site in particular, um, we've been hosting tree planting festivals there over the last nine years. And at times we have over 1,200 people that come together and plant in excess of 10,000 trees over a weekend. Um, a way for me to be able to bring an audience to a point that I suppose allows for a sense of inspiration and maybe brings them into the conversation a little bit is identifying what we've managed to achieve in terms of numbers. So we have planted 150,000 trees over the last 11 years. And that's exciting, but what's more exciting for me is the hands that planted the trees. It's these individuals that decided to step up to the plate to do something significant, to, to get their hands dirty, to participate, to actively engage with landscape restoration. And then trying to lean into a space where I'm allowing for the audience to feel like they can also be a hero. So I'm, I'm one person, I'm just an individual. But 11 years ago, I had an idea to plant a thousand trees. And now 11 years later, we managed to plant 150,000 trees. And if you all look at your hands right now, you're just as capable of my, as myself of starting your own movement, of doing something of real significance. And maybe it does, um, you know, start as just one tree, but maybe you find your own thing, the thing that adds value to your own world and, and brings that sense of magic and allows for you to find the hero that's inside of you. 
And then the last thing that I like to do in rounding up um, my story and, and my journey is, is to try and give people um, a means for them to feel like they have a takeaway. Um, you know, we are always trying to build an audience. We're trying to get people to join our movements because that's the kind of organization we are. We like to see ourselves as um, not necessarily a business, but a way to bring a lot of people together. So an invitation really helps with that to say, if you would like to come along for this journey, if you'd like to, to be part of this tree evolution, um, join us. Um, but then also leaning into the idea that people may not be that interested in trees in particular. They might want to find their own, um, their own purpose, their own thing that they feel like they could be a hero within. Um, so go and find that magic that you feel like is out there. Um, find the thing that allows for you to move from success to significance. Um, yeah, so that's kind of how I bring my story together. The, why, by using specific um, catchphrases that allow for me to, to weave it together through uh, purpose, um, through uh, moving from success to significance, and by leaning into the idea that the audience is able to see me through um, see themselves through through my story and finding their own story. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand it back to Alexander. Thank you very much, Misha. Um, thank you very much also, Bernard, Alessandra, and um, Sam for your great presentations. Um, as you might have experienced, good storytelling often takes a little bit longer. <laughs> but um, I found it important that, that, that we really take the time to, to listen to the full stories and not just interrupt these um, great presentations. Um, we are now um, moving forward um, quickly to the Q&A. And I would also ask the panel, the speakers, to address the questions quite brief and um, yeah, quick. So um, maybe following Misha's presentation, I would like to ask a first question to you. Um, how can one join Green Pop? So how can one support you? Cool, thank you very much. So I generally ask uh, people who would like to get invested in what we do um, to do one of three things. Uh, that is, come and join us on one of our tree planting or restoration missions. We're about to do a big event, which is happening in two weeks time. We're gonna be planting 2000 trees and doing permaculture workshops and biomimicry workshops. You can also sign up to be an activist and there you can run for trees, cycle for trees. You can climb the Himalayas for trees. Otherwise you can just go and donate a tree. So whether you wanna send your grandmother a tree who lives in another country and you'd like to, plant a tree in her name. Um, yeah, those are probably some of the better ways that you can get involved with Green Pop. Thanks. Okay, then going backwards in, in the order um, to you, Bernard, um, a question. Um, what is your vision for the project? Um, so the production of the Kalahari melon seed oil and what is the vision for the product? So what, where do you see yourself, your organization in, in the next years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, um, I didn't really get a chance to talk about our other side of our business, which is more of a retail uh, brand, which uses the oil that we produce on the farm in South Africa, and then we package it nicely and present it for, for the retail market. And storytelling plays a big part in that. So we recognized um, through doing all these PowerPoint presentations that we weren't always getting through and we we made this short film and it was giving us traction but showing and telling is always always gets you even more traction and so having a brand having a, a an end product that we could use as a vehicle to tell our story 
has been quite important for us. So African Origin Oils, the wholesale or the B2B business will continue to produce uh, oil for distributors and, and brands across the world. But we're using Neo Safiri, which is our retail brand, as a conduit with which to tell the story of the wholesale business. Great, thank you. So then kick off question for um, Sam. Um, how would you engage people living in big cities in order to make them experience or sense the wilder world? So how to build up this connection? Oh, it's great. It's a, it's a great question. I think, um, you know, in engaging, you know, living in Cape Town, I'm very lucky to have access to wild places. And, you know, if you are, uh, in, in, say for example, a much bigger city across the world. You know, firstly, stories are are influencing us uh, all the time. Um, you know, we we have uh, indigenous wisdom within our own culture, within our own culture, within our own families that that tell us the story of of, of our connection with nature uh, over time. You know, I find out in your family, in your family kind of history, and in, in your in where they, where people have come from, and, and reconnecting back to, to how, how your, your ancestors or your, uh, the wisdom of the elders were connected with nature. And of course, books are, are, are always the, one of the biggest, you know, for me, one of the biggest incentives. The, the book that I, re I read earlier, um, Thinking Like a Mountain, was one of the most incredible ways in which I can connect with the wild world, um, even though I wasn't experiencing it. And you, one can also experience it through 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 making and doing so like building a permaculture garden getting closer to to um you know having uh, vegetables outside your your room or outside your window having a plant that is over you there, there's many ways that one can ask a question of connecting to a wilder world when asking uh how they can how they can bring it in and you know two other things i'll just quickly mention are biomimicry and biophilia you know biomimicry is is learning from nature not just about nature you know, often as a game ranger, we would talk about something, you know, uh, yeah, uh, antelope or a leopard in, is walking and doing this. But when you ask, how, how do I learn from something? Like here is a bird uh, that is uh, flying and catching a fish in the river with its beak uh, that's so well defined. You know, that's uh, like, how does it do that? And, and it, when we look at nature from that lens, it's, it's, it, it, change, it, it changes our perspective. It makes it, us see nature as a mentor, and nature is everywhere, even though we live in a city. We can still find it because we are nature, nature in ourselves. And that's a big point. We should reduce, stop reducing ourselves or disconnecting ourselves from nature because we are nature in itself. Even look at your own human body to be reconnected to the world itself. Um, and then with biophilia, you know, like I would really look into that topic in terms of uh, how do you bring nature into space? So your walk, your walk wallpaper how do you actually make your room more like a like a forest or, or like a height and that's what biophilia is which is um our love for nature so i hope that i hope that helps yes please um i just want to make an addition to that um i think the world suffers of a divide disease when actually everything is connected, everything is united. And we tend to look at issues, um, yeah, with uh, a narrow, limited lens, as for example, climate change and biodiversity loss. But the issues are intertwined. So when Sam asked me to speak to gender, um, what I would really like to mention from a point of view of storytelling is that when we speaking of gender, we're speaking of social, but it's strictly connected with environmental and economical. They go hand in hand. So yeah, the, yeah, the recommendation is to widen the lens and step back from the issue and try to relate to it with the with the with the bigger approach and a bigger eye, which is an inclusive one and looks at all the aspects. Yeah. 
Okay. Exactly. Then maybe another interesting question. Um, so when there is a project doing forest restoration, protection of biodiversity, um, they, they have a track record, they're doing some significant work for a while, um, and now they want to step up and really improve their story to really carve out what is essential, what brings them further. Um, I'm relating a little bit to what um, Bernard also um, spoke. So um, how would be the approach? So if someone said, okay, we planting trees and protecting leopards somewhere, um, we, we, need, we need a story, so we, we're just doing it. So, but how to make, what, what are the steps, like really technically spoken, what are the steps um, to, to convert the project, what you have into a story that really thrives and um, moves beyond your impact on the ground? I'm just checking that that was directed to us, um, but I, on that note, I think the question there is, is really understanding the context of your story. So, you know, the biggest question that we ask our clients that we work with is what is the problem you are looking to solve? Um, what, do, um, what are you trying to solve for? Um, and, and that's, you know, within your film or whatever it is, you know, sometimes film isn't the answer. Right. So when we work with the clients, it might not be film that you need. But in terms of your project, like your story is based on what you are trying to potentially solve. Um, and film can help like in solving, in, in bringing a character that, that looks at that problem. Um, and I would suggest like, you know, really understanding what the mission is, like what, where are you trying to get to, you know, because being like going to the outcome and then and looking at the problem, uh, is is gives you the opportunity to see see what the story could be you know what is the cave that you need to walk walk into uh that is that is dark and difficult and, and not not really understood so just very specific to that to that question if i if i understood it correctly was really and like break down uh what you are trying to achieve you know what are you trying to achieve and what is the problem you are trying to solve for yeah yeah, th thank, thank you very much. And um, we have to slowly wrap up this discussion because we are quite overdue. Um, but I really want to give everyone uh, like a, a final shout out before we going to close. And before doing that, I want to thank all the participants. Um, yeah, really for, for joining this, this, this webinar. And yeah, we're looking forward to potentially repeat similar sessions and webinar with you. Um, for those who have left earlier, they cannot hear it yet, we will do a recording. So everything what we said today, you can have a look later. So please, your final words. I'm happy to go first. Uh, firstly, sorry for going a little bit over time there on our presentation, Mission Burns, uh, but uh, I think you managed to, to get it across. I just wanted to, you know, my final thing is, um, uh, you know, get outside and start directly experiencing your story and understanding it and, and really feeling into it and understand what is the hero's journey that you need to, you know, it doesn't have to be a film, it could be what is your own hero's journey? What is what is the fear that you can walk towards that is holding the treasure to the answers that is that is there for you? You know, so I just want to say thank you to to obviously everyone that's been a part of this, and yeah, very grateful for the time. Thank you, everyone. It was uh, very exciting to listen to all your stories, and uh, yeah, I I would just maybe conclude by saying that. Um, storytelling as such an unimportant role um, and yeah um, we we definitely want to put the human in the middle and and try to have that human um, experience something that we can fill with that human in order for us to reconnect with the natural world and to solve all the problems that are so urgent 
and yeah, thanks everyone. Um, Pause on to you then, Miss. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, I suppose from my side, when I started my storytelling journey, I was very nervous um, and it, the challenge for me was always that I, there was a perception that you need to be the expert, you need to be an ecologist, you need to be a scientist, and you need to have all the facts. And actually, what I realized is that I just need to start my personal journey, my personal narrative, um, find the things that are meaningful to you, um, speak with passion. Uh, you know, if you're telling your own story, it's easy to come across authentically. Um, and go out there and do things because as soon as you start doing things, you start building your story. You know, if you're if you're not doing things, then the story does come out flat. Go out there, get involved with things, even if it's not your project, um, and and craft that story around the things that you're getting involved with. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm going to hand over to Bernard. Thank you so much to Alex and his team. It's been fantastic. Bernard, over to you. Thanks, Misha. I would echo really a lot of what um, Misha just said there you know get out there let time pass but accompany it with action and learning and if you do that then your 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 journey your story will write itself and you will build that identity capital needed to, to well for a story um and then yeah show people so transparency begets authenticity and it's authenticity that will set your stories apart from someone else's Thanks for having me. I really hope we'll do another couple of these uh, in the in the near future. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks, Alex, for having us and, and, and Sam too. And thanks to the audience. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Take thanks care. Bye-bye.